children and adolescents. We're going to learn to accurately diagnose atopic dermatitis in pediatric patients. Then we'll discuss the relationship between atopic dermatitis and its comorbid diseases, as well as specifically some emerging comorbid diseases that um, have hit the press recently. We'll learn to prescribe appropriate first-line medications for patients with atopic dermatitis based on the disease severity. And as we go, we'll discuss the treatment options as well as the mechanisms, mechanisms of action of some recently FDA-approved targeted therapies for atopic dermatitis. We'll go over a brief overview. We'll talk about the features of AD, the diagnostic criteria of AD, as well as those comorbidities, and then throughout how to treat it. I'm sure all of you learned during your dermatology rotations and just being pediatricians that atopic dermatitis is commonly referred to as the itch that rashes. And that's because itch truly is a cardinal feature of this disease. It's actually one of the diagnostic criteria, and many times itch will precede the rash. There is a bit of a point of confusion with the terminology around eczema, atopic eczema, atopic dermatitis. And I think a brief history lesson that we'll go through will clarify some of this, um, this sentiment that atopic dermatitis is eczema, but eczema is not always atopic dermatitis, just like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. Eczema at its base form is derived from the Greek, and that just means to boil over. And throughout medicine, it's been used to describe pretty much any rash characterized by bubbling or weeping of the skin, certainly of which we see in patients with acute atopic dermatitis. Now the term atopic dermatitis came around around the turn of the century and it really is a constellation of things. We spoke about itch earlier and that certainly is a cardinal feature. We see clinical features of that phenotypic term eczema of boiling bubbling skin and that's all taken place within an atopic diathesis. And that term atopy comes from the Greek atopy, meaning out of place. And it's because these atopic conditions, which include asthma, allergic rhinitis, seasonal allergies, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, and of course, atopic dermatitis, are difficult to classify diseases historically. Although today we're going to learn to categorize the previously unclassifiable or out of place as we discuss diagnostic criteria for atopic dermatitis. Some of the common features, and you'll see here that these common features actually make their way into our diagnostic criteria. So first and foremost, itch. You cannot make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis without itch or pruritus. It is a chronic or a chronically relapsing dermatitis, meaning it can wax and wane. It has to have a characteristic appearance and distribution, which we'll see changes as our patients age, as well as patients have a personal or family history of an, another atopic condition. We've mentioned that it's a chronic, pruritic, systemic inflammatory disease characterized by periods of acute disease flares. It affects anywhere from 5 to 20% of children and 2 to 10% of adults worldwide. The age of onset varies, but most commonly it begins within the first year of life with 50% of cases occurring within the first 12 months of life. 85% appear before age 5. However, there are some cases that do report, um, do present later in life in, in adulthood and adolescence. About 20 to 50% of childhood cases do persist into adulthood. And interestingly, the prevalence is increasing and it does tend to occur in families with other atopic diseases. A few of the archetypical presentations of atopic dermatitis are shown here. First, we'll go through the dark blue line, which shows very early onset, and these patients tend to be more severe in the intensity of the disease. And this shows an oscillatory course with waxing and waning throughout um, infancy as well as into um, toddler age. Some of these patients will remit while others will continue to persist. And so these very early onset patients, it's difficult to discern who will remit early and who will persist on into adulthood. As children get a little older, we do see atopic disease, atopic dermatitis manifesting in our toddlers, in our kindergarten age and school age children. There's also childhood onset. But one important point is you can have a new onset atopic dermatitis case in an adolescent. So a high schooler that has no history of AD um, may be presenting for the first time in your clinics at 15, 16 years of age. And beyond the scope of today's presentation, um, there certainly are adult onset and a more controversial, very late onset 
a form of atopic dermatitis, which we won't be talking about. At its base, atopic dermatitis is a poly, poly or multifactorial disease, and it's due to a constellation of abnormalities with the skin barrier itself, as well as allergen sensitization, microbial dysbiosis with our atopic dermatitis patients having a higher skin colonization with Staphylococcus aureus, and an increased risk of staphylococcal infections, as well as a dysregulated immune system. So the immunology in the skin of both lesional or non-lesional, so active or involved versus uninvolved skin of atopic dermatitis has a, a very skewed inflammatory milieu. And that's going to be relevant when we start talking about our new targeted treatments for atopic dermatitis, because they're actually going to tease apart the abnormal immunology in the skin and use the scientific understanding to better develop targeted therapies to treat this disease. So let's go ahead and get into a case. I think that's the best way to really uh, learn and drive home some of these points. All of these patients you'll see today were patients that I treated in my clinic and we have photo consents to use all of the pictures. Um, this first case, we'll call him James. He was a three month old healthy boy, full term, um, NSVD, no extended stay, normal skin at birth with no recurrent infections or hospitalizations. That's information that I always like to know because in the differential diagnosis of early onset skin disease are congenital disorders. So normal skin at birth is an important point of distinction in my world when I'm seeing uh, babies with bad rashes. His growth charts have been within normal limits. He does have a history of dry skin that does improve with Vaseline. And in my clinic that day, he came in with this red scaling plaque on his face which had no relief with Vaseline or oatmeal baths. Mom and dad stated that he's absolutely miserable. He fusses all the time and is seen scratching his face. The patient, the parents endure significant stress caused by caring for him. And before he came to me, he'd had a, a, a fairly extensive workup that showed a normal CBC, a normal CMP, but numerous positive RAST allergens, which are blood allergy tests, as well as an elevated IgE level. So let's ask ourselves, does James have atopic dermatitis? Well, how do you make that diagnosis? Fundamentally, it's a clinical diagnosis, and I'm sure many of you would look at this baby and say, yeah, absolutely he does, but let's examine that and dissect out why. We'll analyze the historical features, the distribution, the morphology, and associated signs, and apply them to predetermined clinical criteria. And every day in my clinic, I'm excluding mimics. I wanna make sure that I'm treating what I think I'm treating and excluding things that can look just like it. In terms of clinical criteria and, and diagnostic sets, there's a few that, that are widely used. Probably the most simple to use, and one of my favorites, is the Hannafin and Rika criteria, which was developed at University of Pennsylvania about 20 to 30 years ago. And I'm a little biased because I came from this line. John Hannafin trained my mentor, Larry Eichenfield, who's the director of pediatric derm at UC San Diego and Rady Children's Hospital and, and one of my mentors. And so I like these criteria, and you'll see why. They're simple to use. Some of these others um, are better for clinical trials and epidemiology. And then of course, the American Academy of Dermatology, not to be left out, came out with their own, which really is a modified and more extensive Hannafin criteria. So before we get into those criteria though, it's important to understand what it means when it says typical morphology and distribution, and to recognize that that can change as our patient's age. So shown here in this figure are characteristic features in infants, very, very prominent facial dermatitis. So it's very common to have isolated face involvement in an infant with atopic dermatitis followed by um, trunk involvement. Now, as those kids get older, they develop atopic dermatitis in the more classical or canonical distribution that we think of, which would be flexural, so our antecubital fossa, our popliteal fossa. And these really are truly those erythematous scaling plaques. And then as we get older, this flexural involvement actually tends to take a transition towards an extensor involvement. And shown here as an adult, but we certainly do see these types of features in our adolescence as well as isolated hand dermatitis. Some of the common features are thick scale, erythema, accentuation of the skin lines, shown here as lichenification, also shown very well here. And these are markers of severity. And in my world, I would grade these as moderate to severe, um, if not across the board, all severe. Some common findings in patients with atopic dermatitis that in of themselves are not AD, they're not atopic eczema, but are very common in these patients. And I'm sure you see them every single day. Keratosis pilaris, uh, particularly 
non-harmful, absolutely benign and absolutely impossible to treat, scaly follicular papules on usually the bilateral upper arms and sometimes the thighs. Pityriasis alba, which is a hypopigmented, sometimes slightly scaly, thin plaque on the cheeks. And then of course, ichthyosis vulgaris, which is very common in our patients with atopic dermatitis. And this usually gives the lower legs kind of a dry cracked lake bed appearance. So what are those specific criteria I was talking about? Well, here are the major criteria. Like we said before, pruritus. These patients have to be itchy. They have to have that typical morphology and distribution. So more flexural in our adolescents and our older children and facial and extensor involvement in infancy. It needs to be chronic or chronically relapsing. This is a little hard to apply in our um, infants, of course, which they don't have a lot of history, but a personal or family history of atopic disease um, also pops in there. So let's apply these to James and see what we get. We need three out of four. And James, he has three out of the four. And so we can certainly make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. There are minor criteria of the Hannafin criteria. And these are some of the things that we saw before. Xerosis, dry skin, that ichthyosis we talked about, elevated serum IgE, early age of onset. I feel like in daily practice, the minor criteria you see, you don't need to count them up, but if a patient is itchy, has a typical morphology and a family history or a chronic course, it's enough to make a diagnosis. In James's case, he certainly does have three of these 23. For the AAD criteria, probably one of my favorite things that I, that I like that they added are important exclusionary conditions. And this is because of just a fundamental tenet in medicine. I mean, you can't treat a disease if you don't know what you're treating. Sometimes in dermatology, we get lucky, we put a steroid on it and it gets better, that certainly is true, but that's not always the case. You can put steroids on scabies as much as you want and those kiddos are not gonna get better and scabies in babies can really look a lot like AD, as well as certain immune deficiency diseases. Very rare, but it does show up in our patients, um, our infants with bad eczema-like eruptions um, as a congenital immunodeficiency. So it's always important to keep these in the back of your mind. Here's some of those mimickers. Here's a case of scabies in an infant. Ringworm, tinea corporis. You definitely don't want to put steroid on this. It'll be like miracle grow. Just a morbilliform eruption, a viral exanthem. No scale, but definitely erythematous patches. And here's a baby with hyper um, IgE syndrome. So hyper, one of a, a congenital immunodeficiencies. And you see, this looks like an atopic like eruption on the face. So important to keep that in mind. Now, how would you treat James? We've got a lot of options. and Maybe some, maybe all of these, I'm not sure, but we, we we're gonna talk about that today. Antibiotics, antifungals, topical steroids. So I diagnosed James with mild atopic dermatitis. He has pretty prominent erythema, but not a lot of lichenification, not a lot of thickening of the skin. He definitely has seborrheic dermatitis, or in this age group, we just like to call it cradle cap, even though he has pretty extensive facial involvement. He had a touch of impetigo along the chin. So I gave him a low potency topical steroid, hydrocortisone, two and a half percent, ketoconazole cream, and mupirocin. I told mom and dad, mix it all together and get it on his skin twice a day. And this was James six days later, ready for his baby pictures. Mom and dad were super happy. So let's look at how we treat atopic dermatitis in a little more depth, because I think this is something that really we should focus on because every patient is so different. And I kind of like to take a Goldilocks and the three bears approach and grade the patient's severity, think about my options and pick the one that I think is gonna work just right. Try to get right in the middle, not too strong, not too weak. I think of atopic dermatitis treatment kind of like a pyramid. Everyone should be on gentle skincare and we'll discuss what that means. Appropriate use of topical medications, sometimes topical and oral antipyritics need to be added. So, that's important to consider if a patient may need something to help them sleep at night. A lot of times I will use a prescription antihistamine like hydroxazine, which isn't really going to treat the itch, but it, what it is allow, allowing our patients to do is get a good night's sleep so they're not up scratching at night while the topical medications can start working. And then ultimately there are systemic options and we'll discuss some of those in a little bit. For AD skincare, I tell a lot of these particularly infants Bathe them every other day, maybe even every third day. Certainly you clean the diaper area. If they start crawling and they're getting dirty, you clean them. 
but a lot of times, especially my new parents, I see them overwashing, overbathing, and using harsh soaps. Every time you bathe a patient with AD, you have to moisturize a patient with AD. And really thick creams and emollients work best. I usually recommend getting a big tub of just plain white petrol on them um, and locking in that moisture, avoiding our triggers. And then of course, for our role, appropriate medication use. In terms of medications, it really runs the gambit in dermatology. And I like to advise people to kind of pick a medication at each varying strength. So we can kind of go over here, our Robin Hood bow and arrow with our over-the-counter hydrocortisone and graduate up to hydrocortisone prescription strength, which I still think is a very low potency, very safe medication to use, kind of a mid-strength like triamcinolone. And then our big guns over here, medicines like fluosinonide or mometazone or amnocinide, and of course, everyone's favorite, clobetazole. Very strong medications and should be used um, very carefully. There is a role, but it needs to be very careful, especially in our PEDS patients. And for those folks that need long-term maintenance with topical medications or for patients that can't tolerate steroids or parents that don't want their kids to use them, there are other options that are not steroids. And I put them here kind of lined up with their corollary topical steroid strength. So there's pimacrolimus cream, which is about the strength of prescription strength hydrocortisone. There's tacrolimus ointment, which comes in two different strengths, depending on the age of the patient. Under 15, you need to use the 0.03% and over you can use the 0.1%. And another medication, which we'll talk about, one of the new targeted treatments is crisaverol. And I really consider these close to be the same strength as triamcinolone, and they're good to have up your sleeve. So let's take what we learned and apply it to a second case. This is Anissa, a seven month old girl, full term, NSVD, no rash at birth. She's presenting to me itching, redness, oozing, and scaling that developed around two months of age, so early onset. She'd had some workup before she came to me, and she had a leukocytosis of 25,000, eosinophils of 37%, and she'd seen an allergist and had a workup that was notable for many RAS positives and the elevated Ig, as well as the leukocytosis we noted. She'd only tried over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream and elemental formulas that were recommended because of her positive RAS test. She had absolutely no benefit. She cries inconsolably, is constantly scratching during most waking hours and having an extremely negative impact on her parents' quality of life, first time parents, um, really at their wits end by the time they came to see me. So let's ask, does Anissa have AD just to drive home our diagnostic criteria? Well, certainly, she has pruritus. She has the typical morphology and distribution. Not shown here, it was also on her face. It was also on her trunk. Um, it's been chronic throughout her life for five months. And she has an elevated IgE as well as positive RAS tests. So that certainly applies towards this personal history of other atopic disease. In Anissa's case, there was a lot of attention that had been given to her potential allergic tendencies and food allergies, and she'd been put on elemental formulas. And I think that happens a lot. And I think this is a good time to pay special close attention to the atopic dermatitis comorbidities. We've all learned about this in medical school, the so-called atopic march. And while there are many variations in and in it, variations in when and if these conditions do appear, I think it still is very helpful to have something like this in your mind to illustrate the point that patients with atopic dermatitis may have other atopic diseases. And typically, it is the eczema that shows up first, and then canonically, you'll have food allergy followed by asthma and then rhinitis. Some of these may wane as the child gets older, while others may persist. One thing that I'd point out is that not all patients get these, and not all patients with a positive RAS test, which is a radioabsorbent um, assay, basically an ELISA test to say, do you have antibodies, that, IgE antibodies that recognize that allergen? That doesn't mean that you have a true allergy. It doesn't mean you have a food allergy or a type one um, hypersensitivity reaction. And in very few cases does oral allergen avoidance actually impact the skin, probably less than 10% of patients. So I always tell folks when they come to see me, let's not worry about the foods yet, feed your baby, feed yourself, and let's do skin-directed therapies and see how far we can get. And some patients, they still do need to go on and see nutrition or GI, but for the most part, probably greater than 95% of the cases, um, dietary avoidance of allergens is unnecessary in these patients. 
But in recent years, we've learned a lot more about the comorbidities. And I, I like to call this the AD full spectrum because we talked about the atopic comorbidities. But there's other things that we've learned are a big deal for these patients, such as skin pain, sleep disturbance. And I think this is something really important for our, our pediatricians to really uh, at least touch on this when you're seeing a patient with bad AD, because this really does impact school. It impacts education and a, and a patient's trajectory academically, because a lot of our patients have difficulty falling asleep. They have nighttime and early morning awakenings, and they feel unrested and sleepy, which leads to poor school performance. And it runs hand in hand with neuropsychiatric um, disruptions as well. These patients are more likely to have depression, anxiety, suicidality, ADD and ADHD. And this creates an interesting clinical um, paradigm because if you have a patient with ADD and they get put on a stimulant and they have itchy skin, they're gonna scratch that skin a lot more. So it's really become so much more important to treat the AD effectively in our patients with AD and ADD. In addition, there's emerging cardiometabolic and related effects. We'll look at a few slides that go into detail about the cardiovascular disease comorbidities in these patients, as well as increased risk of both skin and non-skin infections. This is called a pathway analysis, and it's been done by one of the leaders in the field of atopic dermatitis, Jonathan Silverberg. And basically what they did is they analyzed thousands of patients and they used statistical analyses to ask the question, how is atopic dermatitis related either directly or indirectly to other diseases that our patients have. And doing this pathway analysis, they were able to show that patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis have an increased risk of anxiety. That anxiety then leads to an increased risk of hypertension and obesity. AD itself does have an increased risk of obesity, an increased risk of diabetes, and an increased risk of food allergy. Now, all of these together, food allergy, diabetes, obesity through its effects on hypertension, all negatively impact cardiovascular function. So ultimately, even though there's no direct effect of AD on cardiovascular disease, through stepwise comorbid conditions, our patients with atopic dermatitis have a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And that's shown here. So these are this is basically stratifying patients based on their severity of eczema or atopic eczema, mild, moderate, and severe. And we can see that whether we look at angina, cardiovascular death, heart failure, ischemic stroke, MI, or stroke, there's a tendency to have higher risk with more severe eczema. And the estimated relative risk increase over here in our box whiskers, we can see that um, there's increased risk of all of these things. So something that until recently has not been appreciated. And I don't think that many of us in our pediatric populations are seeing these effects right away, but it's something to think of as these children grow into adults and all the more reason to treat their disease effectively while they're children. There's also massive impacts on quality of life and many studies have been done in adults and children showing a, a major impact. It impacts social functioning negatively, impacts psychological well-being with effects on stigma, low self-esteem, poor mood, decreasing self-confidence. It's even influenced people's occupational choices and been shown to affect their personal finances. Things that many of us may take for granted, such as what clothes am I going to wear today? Should I shave? Can I use makeup? All of these things are impacted in our patients with AD, which ultimately leads to decreased work productivity and absenteeism. So back to Anissa, how would you treat her? Well, I think this is a nice way to take a second and review step care management of atopic dermatitis. If we go back to our pyramid that we talked about, the basic management in every patient with AD, whether they're non-involved skin, mild disease, moderate disease, or severe disease involves basic skincare. So we're talking moisturizing, taking our baths once daily, or maybe even every other day, avoiding our triggers. And this is always going on in our maintenance mode. But now Anissa, she's acutely flaring and she's at least moderate based on the photos that I showed you. And for a, mod a moderate case, you need a medium to high potency topical corticosteroid. And that's two times a day for three to seven days beyond clearance. And this is a really important point because I find that as, as someone who receives lots of referrals, I'll get patients that have used topical steroids, but just not use them enough. They didn't quite go far enough. They maybe use a lower strength steroid than they needed, or maybe even one that was perfectly strong, but just for a few days. And it really is kind of a treat to clear approach now and not a treat to tolerability. We wanna clear our patient's skin and that requires the right strength steroid for the right duration. And 
in these cases, many times it is DID for two weeks. And now when they're very severe, that's when we start thinking about referral to a specialist. Um, dupilumab, which we'll talk about as a new monoclonal antibody to treat moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And then we always want to circle back. If our patients aren't getting better, well, why is that? Are they not using the medicine? Is there a comorbid infection? Was the diagnosis missed? Maybe they're allergic to something they're touching. And that's called contact dermatitis. And this would be a time that I would encourage um, any and all of you to, to refer out if, if you need an extra set of hands. I'm happy to help. So this is Anissa one week later. Um, this is after triamcinolone BID for a week. The erythema is gone. The skin is less thick. It's healed over, but it's still not, uh, not all the way across the finish line. She's still requiring lots of topical steroids. Mom and dad are starting to wonder if that's safe, which it is, but they're asking questions about, well, what's the long-term plan? So, so what is your next step? To go there, we need to kind of think about all of our different treatment options for moderate atopic dermatitis. Topical steroids have been a mainstay of dermatology for, for decades, and they work very, very upstream. So they're shutting down the inflammatory cascade very early on. We have some other options that work a little farther down the inflammatory cascade. Those are topical calcineurin inhibitors, things like pemacrolimus and tacrolimus. They're a little more targeted. They are very effective. And there's two, pemacrolimus, which is approved for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis down to age two years, and tacrolimus, which is approved to moderate, approved for moderate to severe AD, and it just has a special dosing notation based on the patient's age. So if they're less than 15, 15 or less, you want to use the lower strength. These do have um, some burning and stinging associated with them, and they have a black box warning for rare cases of malignancy, even though I use these medications all the time. There really has not been any reported cases of them causing a lymphoma or malignancy in our pediatric patients ever but it does have that warning and it can give folks some real scares when they pick it up from the pharmacy. So because of that, another medication was developed. It's a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor and it's crisabarol. And the idea behind crisabarol actually dates back to our friend, John Hannafin, who being aware of some basic science studies that abnormal T cells have an increased amount of AMP, which is an intracellular signaling molecule, and knowing that AMP is made from cyclic AMP, and that conversion is mediated by an enzyme called PDE4, he said, well, hey, if we can block PDE4, that should decrease inflammation, right? And so fast forward 20, 30 years past that initial idea, and a drug company developed a targeted topical medication that inhibits PDE4. So it's impairing the conversion of our cyclic AMP to AMP, so we have less of the inflammatory mediators within the cell, and the idea was that we could use this to treat atopic dermatitis. And we're gonna go through the data for a few phase three studies in children and adults with mild to moderate AD. And in 2016, it was approved all the way down to two years of age. And the indication was expanded just this year to three months of age. And I think I may have been the first person in the state to prescribe it because on the day that the FDA approval came out, I just happened to be seeing a three month old who needed it and it was denied. And I talked to the pharmacist for the state and they said, oh, wow, it was just approved. Great, congrats. And, and now we're getting this for our, our infants as well. So here we have data looking at the percentage of patients that achieved clear or almost clear skin on crisabarol versus vehicle. And you can see 33% of patients achieved clear, or almost clear skin in the study within you know, the first 30 days of application. And now clear or almost clear is a great endpoint. We have a hard time getting that in dermatology because so many of the features we see in the skin linger. So post-inflammatory pigmentary change, darkening of the skin from the rash can persist, and that can lead to a patient not making it clear or almost clear, even though in clinical practice, most patients do very well very quickly. And you can see that um, we have patients that are becoming clear or almost clear within a week of application in, in the initial study. One thing that I love about Crisabarol is it works very quickly to decrease itch. And itch is one of those cardinal diagnostic features and something that really bothers our AD patients. And it starts working on itch right away. Within a week, we have 58% of our patients having a significant decrease in their itch. The most common side effect is application site pain. And it's very low in the clinical study, 4.4%. I'll tell you in my clinical experience, it's probably closer to 15 to 20% of patients experience um, burning, stinging, or discomfort at the site of application. 
a couple of tricks I like to tell my patients is to keep the medicine in the refrigerator. That helps take the edge off. You warn them that it may sting. And that in of itself, knowing that can help. And I'll also have them usually mix it with whatever topical steroid I prescribed previously or that I prescribed simultaneously. I don't have people put Eucrisa or Chris Aberol, excuse me, directly on inflamed skin. I usually calm it down with a topical steroid first. And three or four days into that, I have them transition to Chris Aberol in patients that need it. And here's our patient, Anissa. She was transitioned to Chris Aberol as well as fluocinolone oil, which is a nice low potency topical steroid, similar strength to hydrocortisone, but it comes in a very nice peanut oil. So it's easily spreadable, very moisturizing, um, three to four times weekly. And she did absolutely great. So moving right along, case three, this is Sarah. She's a six-year-old healthy girl, very dry, very itchy skin. She has recurrent itchy rashes behind the knees and the elbows. She has many nighttime awakenings due to itch. She wakes up with blood on the sheets. She has daytime tiredness that's impacting her kindergarten performance. And her mom has atopic dermatitis. So does Sarah have AD? Well, certainly. At this point, I think we've gone through it enough times to know that paritis, absolutely. That typical morphology, flexural identification that we can see in our children as well as our adolescents and adults. This is chronic, chronically relapsing, and she has a family history of atopic disease. So Sarah was started on triamcinolone, a, moder a, a moderate strength topical steroid, BID for two weeks, and she really had minimal improvement. I mean, there's still a lot of erythema here, better, but definitely not as much as we'd want. In addition, she has atopic dermatitis on about 15% of her body surface area. And mom and dad say, this is really hard to put the medicine on all over twice a day. Now at this point, I switched her to Chris Averall, which is our targeted PDE4 inhibitor to minimize her topical steroid exposure. And she had no benefit, very, very little benefit. It kind of worked just as well as the triamcinolone and, and wasn't taking her across the finish line. So what would your next steps be for Sarah? We could consider a stronger steroid. We could consider allergy testing. We could consider maybe a systemic medication. And for Sarah, it would be appropriate to start her on a systemic medication um, after reviewing the risks and benefits with mom and dad. And we'll talk now about some of the emerging targeted treatment options in AD. As I hinted at earlier, this being a multifactorial disease that ultimately really results in very, very abnormal immune dysregulation. Companies have come on out and tried to target specific mediators of the disease. And the first one available that achieved FDA approval was dupilumab, which was a monoclonal antibody that targets IL-14 and IL-13 signaling, which you can see here is right at the center of the inflammatory cascade. It's been approved in adults ages 18 and older, initially in March of 2017, was approved down to 12 years of age in 2019. And then just earlier this year, I think maybe in May, it was approved down to six years of age. And the way this medication works, it's a monoclonal antibody um, that blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha. So IL-4 receptor alpha is a common receptor chain that's shared between the IL-4 cytokine receptor and the IL-13 cytokine receptor. So by blocking IL-4 receptor alpha with dupilumab, you're able to mitigate signaling through IL-4 and IL-13. And now these cytokine receptors, they further signal through JAK-STAT signaling pathways within the cell that lead to activation of B cells, T cells, monocytes, eosinophils, fibroblasts, epithelial cells, smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, monocytes, B cells. And so by being able to shut down these type 1 and type 2 receptors, we're really able to modulate um, the immune dysregulation that occurs in the disease. Dupilumab has been studied extensively and it has great data. So here's data across three different clinical trials, SOLO1, SOLO2, and Kronos. And we can see that within, um, I think this was within the first 16 weeks, if I recall, we're getting 38% of patients approximately across the board that are achieving a score of clear or almost clear. This was reduplicated um, in paritis scores. We see that patients have much lower itch very, very quickly. Um, and that's even better when patients combine their treatment with topical corticosteroids. Here is the data reduplicated by Eric Simpson, a pediatric dermatologist in Oregon, who studied dupilumab's use 
as 300 milligrams every four weeks or either a 200 or 300 milligram dose every two weeks, both of which are approved in pediatric patients depending on their weight and showed that just like we saw in adults, this medicine works very fast. Within four weeks, we have patients that are 75% clear. Within you know, 12 weeks, we have even more patients that are 75% clear. And we have patients that are becoming totally clear and almost clear right away. And these were in adolescents. The data shown here are patients ages 12 to 17. The most common side effects across all of the clinical studies were runny noses, some injection site reactions, some conjunctivitis. But notably, if you look, our patients that got AD exacerbations, which technically is an adverse event in a clinical trial, is much lower in all of our dupilumab treated groups. I just think it's funny to point that out, it's as you would expect. The dosing is all dependent on how much a patient weighs. So if you're big, you get a big dose, 60 kilograms or more. It's a 600 milligram loading dose, and then every two weeks you're getting 300. For patients that are 30 to 60, it's a slightly lower dose, 400 milligrams, and then every two weeks they get 200 milligrams. But for those lucky little ones that um, are unlucky enough to have the disease, but lucky enough to only need one shot a month, if you're 15 to 30 kilograms after the loading dose, it's just one 300 milligram shot every month. So that's a little easier on the little ones. And here's Sarah. She responded fabulously. This is four weeks after starting uh, dupilumab. And um, she does great. She comes into my clinic every month for her shot and her lollipop. And um, she's very happy and so are her parents. That brings us to the end of the targeted medications for atopic dermatitis that are currently FDA approved. But this is an exciting time to be in dermatology. There are numerous emerging targeted therapies that are in phase two, phase three, and um, phase three clinical trials that are pending FDA approval. These run the gambit of topical and systemic anti-inflammatories, specific anti-itch therapies, barrier repair therapies, and then medications for AD-related diseases like asthma and eosinophilic esophagitis um, are also on the horizon. Here's just an example of where we stood um, as of August of 2019 when this table was adapted from. We have medications that target aryl hydrocarbon receptors, IL-13, IL-31. If you haven't heard about IL-31 yet, keep it on your radar. This is the master regulator of itch in the skin. If you're talking about itch, you're talking about IL-31. And nemolizumab has actually moved on to phase three trials now. And this is going to be a great medication just to target itch. And it'll be very interesting to see how it's used in combination with other medications, um, such as dupilumab, which targets IL-4 and IL-13. We have additional PD-4 inhibitors coming out. This is the Crisaverol class of medications. We have um, TRPV-1 receptor modulators. These are nerve receptor modulators. So a lot of very exciting things. In summary, atopic dermatitis is a very common disease in infants, and it may persist throughout life. You should consider multiple differential diagnoses when examining these patients with an eczematous dermatitis. I would urge all of you to be aware of the comorbid diseases in atopic dermatitis and note that they don't only include other atopic diseases. They include things like sleep disturbance, neuropsychiatric illnesses, and cardiovascular disease. So when you're seeing that patient with eczema or bad eczema, keep in mind there may be much more that's being impacted in their life than just what you see in the skin. And that's something that I really enjoy doing and addressing in my clinic. So if you, know, if, if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, we reviewed the basics of AD management, including skin care, trigger avoidance, and anti-inflammatory agents when indicated. Um, and severe AD, it requires systemic treatment. It's just like any other severe chronic disease. We wouldn't withhold our asthma medications or an asthma patient. It should be the same for atopic dermatitis patients. And we reviewed two agents that target specific components of the atopic dermatitis inflammatory process that are currently FDA approved. And we hinted and a few others that are on the horizon. So again, it's a very exciting time, and I thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions at all, and uh, that's it. I have, I have a couple of questions. That was a great talk, by the way. Thank you very much from a, you, one wash you guy to another. <laughs> Thanks, um, Dr. Strominger. You know, have, would you recommend using any of the other oral medications like Singular combined with Pagamet, combined with Allegra and Zyrtec and, and sort of alternating those around to try and see what might help? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that 
certainly if our patients have an indication to be on them for comorbid atopic disease like asthma, absolutely we're on track. If we're talking about atopic dermatitis in isolation, those medications aren't necessarily going to help and they're not necessarily going to be harmful. It's, it's quite interesting. Some patients do great on antihistamines. Other patients, it dries out their skin a little more and that triggers the itch. I like to use sedating antihistamines sparingly at nighttime to really drive down the um, nighttime awakenings while I give my topical medications time to work. That's great. The only other question I had, and maybe it's not a question, but a concern is a pediatric ophthalmologist, you know, I always worry about using high potency steroids around the eyes because I have seen on occasion a couple of cases where it can get absorbed and cause cataracts or glaucoma. So, and then you're, and you're putting a lot of that on the face in some of these infants. Have you come across any of those issues on any of your patients? You're 100% correct. And just for everyone that's listening, it is absolutely true that chronic topical steroid use on or around the eyes can lead to cataracts and glaucoma. I haven't had that occur under my supervision, but I've definitely managed patients that have had development of cataracts and glaucoma from excessive topical steroid use over time, as well as being exacerbated by systemic steroid use. Um, we know, if you're a Dr. Schrominger, a pediatric ophthalmologist, I'm sure you know, but I'll share with the rest of our listeners, some of those minor criteria for atopic dermatitis, if we look at our Hannafin criteria, are keratoconus and subcapsular um, cataracts. And so our patients with AD already have a predisposition for ocular disorders. And it's very important to be a guardian of the eyes. I, I feel that way as a dermatologist at least. And because of that, I will use topical steroids very sparingly on or around the eyes, but these are patients that I usually see weekly and I transition them very rapidly to a topical non-steroidal such as pimecrolimus, tacrolimus, or now crisaverol. I don't usually use topical steroids on the face, specifically on the eyelids for more than a week at a time. But unfortunately, the world we live in, um, with so many of our um, pediatric patients having Medicaid, they have to trial hydrocortisone before we can get a non-steroidal approved. And it's easy for me to do in my office, but I imagine for most of our general pediatricians, going through the prior auth to get hemocrolimus or tacrolimus approved through Nevada Medicaid is, is onerous, but we've got it pretty streamlined. But 100%, you're right. I've seen it happen to patients, and we've got to be very careful. Great. I'll read off some of the questions from the chat. Um, Dr. Hardy is asking if some of the meds you mentioned are used for asthma. Yes, Dr. Hardy, that's an outstanding question. Do pilumab, which is the monoclonal antibody that targets the um, IL-4 receptor alpha, so minimizing signaling through IL-4 and IL-13 pathways, is also duly approved for asthma. It's also approved for nasal polyps and is pending additional approvals. And Dr. Sharma Parisi is asking, how do you tackle a discussion with parent of a child with atopic dermatitis who does not want to use the steroids medications and wants to go the quote natural route um, to, to decrease the flare ups? Yeah, that's a great question. And I have this conversation probably two or three times a week. When I was in San Diego, I had it a lot more. <laughs> but usually what I'll do is I'll explain that Atopic dermatitis is a severe skin disease and it needs serious treatment. For patients that absolutely don't want to use steroids, I will just jump to medication just like Crisaverol. And I'll explain that it may sting a little bit, may not work as quickly, but it would be technically natural because Crisaverol is a boron-based molecule and it's um, derived from boron and it targets a natural pathway. And we see a lot of steroid phobia and it has to do, I think, with social media and misinformation. That's one strategy I approach. And the other way I approach it is with buy-in. And I I sometimes have the luxury of spending more time than probably a lot of our general pediatricians. My schedule is busy, but I can play catch up. I can do a three minute skin check on an adult to spend 20 minutes with a pediatric patient that needs it. And I'll just sit there and I'll explain, you know, I know exactly what your child has. I know exactly how to treat it. And it's not going to be quick. It may not be easy, but if you stick it out with me, we will make them better. And sometimes kind of having that candid conversation um, and being able to take the stance of, a, of an expert you're able to convince them just to use the medications. You tell them um, we're gonna get them off very quickly. And knowing how to treat the diseases, I'd say 95% of my patients with the right steroid for the right duration are clear within one to two weeks. 
And, um, and I think having that type of parental buy-in, you show them you can get the baby better, um, really helps a lot. And uh, Dr. Frazee asked and, and uh, knows that you answered it a little bit, but maybe talk a little bit more about barriers to getting the medications, um, especially with Nevada Medicaid. Yeah, so it's, it is a serious challenge and there's multiple different Medicaids. And so you have to also know which Nevada Medicaid are you dealing with. A few different things that can be really particularly helpful if you have an MA that's gonna work on your prior auth. Um, and sometimes you have to put it in your note because they wanna see documentation. You can say things like, it's for use on the face. That can definitely help you get from a topical steroid to crisabarol. And crisabarol is on some of the Nevada Medicaid plans. And now with it being FDA approved down to three months of age, it's much easier to get it, um, but you do have to go through that fight. Um, other ways to work to get it approved. Sometimes I will just tell the patient, we're gonna prescribe both medicines right out the gate and the hydrocortisone is going to be filled immediately. And the next day we're gonna do a prior auth for the pimacrolimus, tacrolimus, or crisabarol. And honestly, you know, we do partner with industry a fair amount. We do clinical trials and having samples can be really helpful to get a patient covered for those three to four days until you have the medication approved. And I will remind um, members of the American Academy of Pediatrics, there is a, a hassle form that you can fill out at the national level, but even if you put on things for state level insurance plans, um, they'll get filtered down to me through the academy. Um, when I ran my husband's practice in Massachusetts, I was part of a, a team of pediatricians, primary care pediatricians out of um, Boston Children's. And it was just great to be able to collaborate together when we approached the insurance companies um, because there was more, more often than not just um, miscommunication between what the doctors thought they needed to go through to get approvals, what the insurance companies were doing. So um, this is one of the benefits of our professional association is if you're having this issue, your peers are having this issue. So working together to clear up the communication can help a lot. And um, another one from Dr. Hardy, what skin moisturizer is best to avoid irritations? Um, let me make sure I heard. What skin moisturizer is best to avoid, to avoid yeah. irritation? Yeah. Well, so I, I think that's a, a million dollar question, a great question. What, I, what I'll do is I'll answer it in a slightly different way. I will give you what I think are the best creams or moisturizers to avoid skin irritation instead of being mean to anyone like Eucerin or Aquaphor which are sometimes common offenders due to their high concentrations of lanolin, which is a very common contact allergen in our patients with atopic dermatitis. Honestly, when I see a new baby or a new patient that comes in with atopic dermatitis, I do something called a preemptive avoidance strategy or PEAS, preemptive avoidance strategies, which means I put them on what I know is a hypoallergenic skincare routine. And that moisturizer I always pick is white petrolatum, just good old fashioned petroleum jelly. And when patients are like, really? Petroleum jelly, isn't that toxic? Cause acne, X, XYZ, whatever they wanna say. I remind them, well, that eucerin, that, that aquifer you're using, that's petroleum jelly plus. Petroleum jelly plus chemicals, plus preservatives, plus things that you don't need. Um, and I really like to take a PEAS approach for pediatric patients because it's very difficult to identify things that truly do irritate or cause allergy in their skin. I do a lot of allergic contact dermatitis, which requires patch testing, and I do it in pediatric patients when necessary, but it's cumbersome and it's best to, you know, this was a study done by a colleague of mine, Dr. Goldenberg and Dr. Jacobs a few years ago, where they put out the biggest offenders, the most common contact allergens. And if you Google peas and Goldenberg, you'll be able to find um, a nice table that shows you products that you can empirically avoid. So I'll just start people just on, you know, don't even use any soap. If you pick one, I like them to go to Vanny Ply's website or Vanny Cream's website and get a hypoallergenic soap, use Vaseline, use their medications only, and then back in a week. And then we'll start adding things back into their regimen. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions, although certainly uh, participants still on the line are welcome to um, uh, unmute and ask them or put some in the chat, but I will lead the virtual applause. That was a great talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. If anyone ever needs anything, I'm happy to give you my cell number. You can text me. I'll have my staff call your, um, call your patient and get them in right away. It's 702-279-8500. Uh, Again, it's 702-279-8471. I'm always happy to chat to my colleagues here in town.
um, and give our patients the best care. I mean, it's the only way. So let me know if you ever need anything. That's great. That's great. And the rest of our meeting is um, is social. But before we launch into the social, and um, I think my husband's going to demonstrate making a cocktail, I have one more poll for everybody. Oh, we do have one more question for you, Dr. Cotter. Um, do you do telemed for patients up in Reno? Um, yeah, as of right now, we're able to do telemed for quite a few of our different insurance carriers. And that's been, you know, actually born out of the COVID pandemic. And it depends on the insurance, for, especially for the Medicaids, um, that has not been an issue. And so I would say if there's a patient up there, we should have them call. Sometimes it's difficult to do for a new patient, but I can always do a pro bono telemed as a new, and then we can, you know, do subsequences and establish patient if we need to. I mean, I, I'm very much pro access. I'm a Vegas born guy, been away for a while, and I believe in being back here and giving good care to our community. So whatever it takes. I have patients fly in from Reno to see me sometimes, actually. Are you a member of our chapter? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I heard about the meeting because I know Jeff Ng, who's married to our amazing Dr. Greenspun, and that's how I got initially connected. But I think that I should join AAP. I think that'd be really, really there a nice way to get more involved. <laughs> so I'll be reaching out to do that. Great. That's great. We can get you doing one of our walk with the docs that we do for families. And yeah, in talk about sun sun protection. Oh, that's perfect. I love that yeah, idea. That'd be great. All right. Well, wonderful. 